Um, Nigel has been one of our organizers. He's done a fantastic job of making this day what it is for you. He's going to give a very different security talk than ones we've had at the local meetups because he's going from a sort of non WordPress perspective. So I will leave you to it. Thank you, Nigel. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do feel as a slight outsider in as much as uh, I've probably been more active and more part of the security community as opposed to the WordPress community. Uh, I've really only got involved in WordPress since I uh, retired, so uh, something to, uh, let's just say security is a bit of a passion, whereas WordPress is, is, is a bit of an interest. Uh, I wouldn't describe myself as a WordPress expert, but I would like to think I've got some uh, significant experience in security. The perspective of outside looking in, that's one of my favourite pictures to do with security for uh, kind of obvious reasons. Uh, and it sort of does have a serious point where, depending whether you're on the other side of that fence looking this way or on the outside looking in, you get a different impression of what's going on. And what I'm tr trying to get across in this talk is the usefulness and the importance of trying to find a different perspective on uh, on looking at the, examining your, your website. Because you tend to spend most of your time logging into WordPress and looking at the dashboard and doing all stuff from the inside. But you don't maybe quite as put the same effort into looking at it from the outside. So again, to try and <coughs> testing what and why. Testing needs to be part of the management process. It's not a case of you design a website and then you try and secure it. It has to be part of the process and you really want to be trying to adopt a bit of a security mindset, which for the most part is being inquisitive and questioning and going, why is that like that? Is that right? Uh, now, there are all different sort of frameworks and uh, I think the, the name for it, uh, uh, ways of different methodologies for looking at uh, your life cycle model, what's your life cycle of your website, etc. etc. Uh, I quite like the NIST one, which one of the advantages of it being NIST, which is uh, to do with the American government, is anything that's produced by the American government is copyright free. So feel free to make use of it. And there, that particular image is showing that, in effect, there are kind of five general areas to that, where you've got identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. But without dwelling on that too much, the point is it's part of an overall life cycle. Uh, that's just saying what NIST stands for. That's another way of uh, View, kind of picturing the same framework but again they're showing it as being circular so it's an ongoing process you never finish doing it you, you should be uh, always trying to stay on top of it and considering security as part of it now this is where I kind of like the what I think of as the motoring analogy or the MOT test you have lots of drivers who drive a car they don't necessarily know how to service the car. They might not be experts in what goes on under the bonnet. But if you've ever failed an MOT test because a light bulb was out, next time you go to take your car for an MOT test, you at least check the lights, maybe check the tyres, check a few things. It doesn't have to be technical, it doesn't have to be that difficult. Uh, and I see security in the same way. People should take an active interest in looking at how the website is secured. But there are still times where you would want to go and employ a specialist, a pen tester, to then do that properly. But just as you would check your car before you take it for an MOT, you should check your website before you get a pen tester in. Because otherwise, you're paying them to do something which half of the work they'll do will be stuff you could have done anyway. Another one which I would just mention briefly is PCI DSS, which 
if anybody's ever come across that, is payment card, payment card industry data security standard. I spent most of my life in financial services, so that one is kind of one I got to know rather well, which comes from the UK Cards Association. Without going into all, there's 12 high-level requirements which fall into uh, six categories. And simply looking down the bottom, regular, mon regular monitoring test networks and regularly test security systems and processes. So essentially, if you've got a website that's taking card payments, you should be abiding by the UK Card Association. And if you were a big merchant or a bank, you would be required to get professional pen testers in to test your site. If you're a small merchant, well, that's obviously there's, you get into grey areas. But it's just, it's another reason why you, you want to take security kind of seriously. Now, in order to do security testing from the outside looking in, the way I would suggest doing it is to use a Linux distribution that's called Kali. Now, some people may know of Kali and some people may not, but Kali is essentially Unix. But on top of that Unix, the people that uh, maintain and put this together have installed oodles and oodles of security utilities. Now, I'm going to concentrate mainly on one, and then at the end I'll mention some others that are on there that are worth having a look at, possibly spending a bit of time on. But in order to get that running, I've got a Windows PC here. So how am I going to run Linux on that? And the answer is, for me, VirtualBox. There are other um, virtual machine emulators out there, VMware and others, etc. I happen to like VirtualBox. I found, uh, I used to use VMware, but then I found VirtualBox was, I found slightly easier. So, in order to get started, go to that URL, install it, and away you go. You've then got VirtualBox loaded. It doesn't ask you anything other than, do you want to install this? Yes. Sits there for several minutes, and then at the end of it says, yep, that's you installed. And you've got an icon in your desktop. So the next step is to then go to a site where you can get Kali. Now, obviously, you want to get it from a trusted source. And the place I would suggest is the distribution produced by Offensive Security, which is a well-regarded security firm. Uh, now, on that link that I've given there, you'll see that it says VMware, VirtualBox, I think there's another Kali Linux image. So there's about three different images there. There's actually six, because there's a 32-bit and a 64-bit for each. So for me, I go to the VirtualBox image and take the 64-bit one. Uh, that's the only thing to be wary of there. And what you should be downloading is a single OVA file. Now that's a big file, that's three gigabit, so I'm not going to attempt it just now. <laughs> uh, but if you've got decent uh, Wi-Fi at home, it shouldn't take too long. At home for me it's about 10 minutes, so not too bad. Um, now, at this point I shall flip over to, uh, this is not doing what I want it to do. Excuse me a minute. I thought I had this sorted, but... Right, okay, I'm going to have to do it that way. This only happens when you're trying to do things in front of a room. Yes, so that's me showing the Oracle uh, VirtualBox manager. So normally you would come along, you would at that screen there go to import 
you do import and you give it the name of the OVA file and you import it and it sits there and chunters away again that takes several minutes for that to be ingested as it were but there's nothing difficult about doing that what I would say oops, thank you we'll kill the sound on that um, what I would say is when I download the system I always get an error when I try and run it and if you go into settings you'll see there I have got that set to I think you can see that just about USB 1 it defaults to a USB 2 controller and it always fails on any machine I've ever tried it which is this one in my desktop at home uh, so don't be surprised if that happens and you see an error saying it doesn't like USB 2 don't worry about it just go into settings change USB 2 to USB 1 and you'll be okay you can then start that and away you go but I will just start that it takes a little bit it also mentioned down there which is just flash by it will tell you in the, uh, the notes there what the user ID and password is for this the system which used to be root and tor until this release. Be root, root as well. Uh, okay, that's before my time. Right. Uh, root and tors, when I was doing it, where tor is root backwards. Um, but this one, they've changed it to Kali and Kali. So Kali and Kali, and you log on, and away you go. And we're up and running with a full Kali Linux distribution which is essentially comes pre-installed with lots and lots of goodies. You can spend hours and hours investigating those for doing all sorts of security testing, to use the terminology. Um, now, as far as this is concerned, I have got on here, on my Windows box, a little kind of dummy oh come on it's being slow little dummy wordpress website which is being hosted in Vietnam which I'll, I'll, I'll see if that can come back to that hey uh, all right okay just remember there that there's uh, quite an interesting little command which they added in this version of Kali in fact I think it was the last one and this is just proving to be awkward to switch between them that is quite obviously a Unix type environment. Now, I've already boosted the, the size of the font on that so that it should be quite readable. And they came up with this nice little command called Kali Undercover, which is just a pure indulgence for a techie who happens to be kind of interested in And it kind of looks like Windows. So if for some reason you're out and about and you don't want people to think that you're hacking with, not, I mean security testing with um, Kali Linux, you can make it look very much like Windows if you so want to. Uh, and if I simply run that again, Kali Undercover, it just toggles it all back. And we're back to looking like good old proper uh, Kali. As I say, a minor indulgence, but it was one of those features that was being much talked about in the, the latest version. Uh, right. So, I had tried to make the switching a bit neater than that, but never mind. And this was just purely a little bit of a note as to say what it is I think I've got running here. I'm hoping it is running. Uh, I simply had to set up some a couple of host settings so that what I've set up is a, a URL called local Apache and I can then start using that as a URL rather than typing 
uh, IP addresses all the time, which is never very sightly. Um, so I'll come on to that. And then essentially the main tool I want to use is a thing called WP Scan, which as the name suggests is for scanning WordPress, WP. And it's a community type, small community that produced this as a kind of freeware and you're quite at liberty to go and get it and use it. But rather than installing it, it can be quite tricky to install. So the easiest way of getting this up and running is by getting Kali with it pre-installed, get going with Kali and it should just run. And there's a number of commands here which are in the, the kind of slide, but I'll now attempt to switch back to those and actually show you some of them. Uh, now, let's just check that. My worst nightmare, why is that doing that? This is not. <coughs> that says it's up and running. one I'm afraid. Now, who am I going to get? Is that app installed on your Windows, right? You're looking, you're looking at all the and that, and you're on the, on the bash shell, you're, don't you have, do you have to get into the, the app, splash slash, uh, it, essentially, it, the the hosts should be have that local dot Apache, and that is failing because this is going to try to attach to the network in here, which although sort of non-existent, it's going to try to attach to, and it's causing me a big problem. Ah. Uh, if you go to HTTP/conf. Uh, and have a look to see if the uh, local is specifically uh, directing it to that. Uh, wait a minute. Right, okay, now I'll know what I need to do. Bear with me one minute. Right, this needs to be 168, 56, dot one, and that's going to complain, and we'll say yes, and then we'll save it. Right. Oh boy. In fact, I need to go back to Cali now and do sudo slash etc. hosts Cali and that was fifty six one. Right. Now, fearless man. I should get away with it. There we go. So, simple little website running in Bitnami and Zam. And if I go to Cali, and I go to the Cali browser, I should be able to do famous last words local.apache slash wordpress. And there we go. So, we're sorted. 
and it wasted. Slight delay. So, I've got a nice little test set up working now within my local machine. So it's all local. I'm not doing, I'm not uh, connected to network. Uh, not really. Uh, so, I go to here and do WP scan URL local dot Apache slash WordPress. That's basically because ZAMP always installs it into a subdirectory called WordPress. I just hit return on that. This will go away. It might ask me if it wants to update, in which case the answer is no. No, it doesn't. Right, OK. And it goes and finds out lots of information about your website. Now, you can see there I've left one nice little nugget for it to find a red alert. As in, I've deliberately left a config.old file sitting there, which is an absolute no-no for anyone who doesn't realise that or know that. But again, if you're using this as a tool to help you, you don't need to be an expert in it. You just run the tool and see what it tells you. And it's, it's not bad at kind of highlighting the things that, oh, that's a red. That's something you really do need to be concerned about. If you don't understand it, go and find somebody who does. <laughs> because it needs to be sorted. <laughs> it's important. Um, now, most of the security testing when you look at uh, WP Scan tends to be either plugin related or user related. Most of the plugins, it's really a case of are your plugins up to date? And the other thing about plugin scanning is it takes time. So I'm kind of going to sidestep that because it doesn't make for a good presentation. Users, on the other hand, is much more interesting and in some ways more important. And the other thing about the user setup is in terms of if somebody tries to hack into your website using user credentials, how do you know if there's anything there to try and stop them? Because you might have stuff configured within WordPress as a, some form of security plugin, which may or may not work. I have tested quite a few that didn't work, at least not in the way that they were claiming to. So, hence the value of testing. Um, but also, your provider, whoever's hosting it, may have all sorts of intrusion detection systems or web access firewalls or various different countermeasures to try and protect your site. You will only really find out about that if you go and do some rudimentary testing and see whether or not you can get through. Now, the, the next little, in fact, I just need to change the directory here because on Cali, they're in amongst all the utilities. They provide word lists. Now, for anybody who's uh, ever tried or looked at hacking with regards to trying to guess passwords, one of the ways you do it is you get a tool of some description, of which WP Scan will work for us, and you feed that tool a dictionary of passwords and say, here's a whole load of passwords, go and, go and try them on these accounts and tell me if you find any. Now, <coughs> oh, I should just have done here this. In there, and it, it's in the, the, the full command for it, it's in the slides, there's quite a famous one called RockQ, which comes from a website, the RockQ website, which was hacked many years ago. And they had very poor encryption, and they basically got all the passwords on the site. And that became a bit of a de facto dictionary. There's an awful lot of passwords in there, and they're all real world ones, ones that people use. When it comes to passwords, if you try and think up a password, 
don't be misled into believing you're the only person to have ever thought that password. Humans are predictable in all so many ways, and I guarantee somebody else will have already used that password. <coughs> so for that reason, I use randomly generated passwords where at all possible. Uh, don't think you can try and uh, make them up such that you can remember them and that they'll be a good password. So if I do WP scan, in fact, I'll go back to the URL. Right, so I'm, I'm now in the right place to be able to do passwords and I'm going to use ROQ, which I have to say is a big dictionary. In most cases you wouldn't start with using such a big dictionary because there are thousands of thousands of passwords in there. But if I just run that and see what happens, now the default for this is when WordPress tries to, uh, WordScan, WP scan, tries to assess the website, it will try and enumerate the first 10 users. So for that reason, I've set up 10 users on here. You can tell it to do all users, which if it's a big website, not that I would have tried it on any, uh, you can get thousands of users. That can be very interesting. Um, but there you go, it's now throwing that dictionary at that website. Now this is local, so it's doing it slightly quicker than it would across a network. But the point is, we've just thrown several hundred passwords at that, and it's gone and got every single one. And there we go, from one, two, three, up to all those. Now, if you've used a password that's based on somebody's name or somebody's pet or whatever else, there's a high likelihood that if somebody really wanted to get into your website, they could leave a PC running either at home or somewhere else and just leave it in the corner until it eventually gets one. It will sit there and do that all for days. You can, you can easily throw hundreds of thousands of password attempts at a website, so you need to have some other form of mitigation or some other uh, security on that. So let's just go back to the website. Whoops. Now, if I, I'm going to fire up two tabs here, just because right, I'm in that one. So I'll log on. And user, I think one, two, three, four, five, six should get us in. And lo and behold, we have 10 users. But only one of those is an administrator. So, in true hacking tradition, I'm not really too interested in the rest. I'll just concentrate on the one called user. Now, The other thing on here is, I go to plugins, don't have very many plugins. I've got one called Limit Login Attempts. Now I've activated that. I have changed the settings on this so that it will only, the default is it will lock you out for 20 minutes. I've changed that to one minute, that's the least I could do. <laughs> uh, so. If I come back to here and try that again, it will turn to the way, it finds that nice little nugget there, does the f oh, 10 users ever, and now it's just going to sit there and it should come back with various um, it's just contemplating, there we go and you can see that it's kind of hacking away and the attempts just keep going up but it's not finding anything because the website itself is going uh -uh, not getting in so it's that easy to try and mitigate somebody hacking in now 
the thing that makes this particularly uh, an important thing to bear in mind is some of the security login attempt limiting plugins that I've seen will prevent logins where somebody is attempting at a login screen to interactively log in. But this software uses various techniques. It can use the XML um, uh, RPC, that's the one, thank you. Uh, and it can also use cookies, where it essentially writes the password to a cookie, then says, can I get in? No. Change the cookie. Can I get in? No. Change the cookie. And again, it's very quick. You, it can do uh, at least one a second, very often a lot faster than that. So you can have something sat there checking the obvious passwords. So it really, you kind of think, well, that's quite important. Now, being from a security background, one of the things which gets hammered home is what often gets referred to as the onion principle. You want to have security in layers. You don't want to have what also gets referred to as a spoof, a single point of failure. So, okay, we can have a plug in there and we can have it so that it stops uh, an attack like that, so that it limits it. And incidentally, if you don't think people are trying to attack your website, you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, I get on av well, last year I looked up the stats and I got 150 emails where those emails said it detected four uh, invalid attempts and had subsequently locked out that IP address for 20 minutes. Now, that's working out two a day because that's 600 actual invalid attempts. Uh, so if you're not, if you've got software on there and it's not telling you that somebody's trying to hack in, you're wrong. Now, my website is just a little personal homepage, but maybe I just get paranoid uh, as I describe it. I'm a professional, or was a professional paranoid. Even leading up to this talk in the last couple of weeks, the number of people trying to hack it in my website has gone up. I don't know if it might be any of you or not, but somebody's been having a go. It's a, it's a reputation, yeah. As an IT pen tester, so they want, to, they want to get to you. Technically, I'm not a pen tester, but yes. Uh, anyway, I'm going to deactivate that one. Because what I also want to do is say, well, okay, and this onion principle, is there anything else we can do to protect ourselves from somebody trying to hack in? Because like it or not, one of the most prevalent ways of trying to attack a website is people just try and see if they can log in using Absolutely. stolen credentials. Yeah, just type in a WP admin and you actually see the admin page. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's, there's people out there, some e-commerce website, they work for sites, have got their WP admin and still that, that link yeah. in their sites. Yeah, it's shocking. I mean, I, I had a uh, I still do have a, a LinkedIn account. You know, LinkedIn got hacked many years ago and my password got discovered. It was a randomly generated eight characters. I still get emails to this day of so-called hackers saying they've hacked my home PC, here's my password, if I don't do something about it, uh, if I don't pay them so many Bitcoin, they will etc etc you, you may have had these yourselves um, again that's another reason for having different passwords for every account but I've had various things where the, uh, you've been pwned has contacted me and said your, your credentials have been found in the wild this email address this password so I go and look up my password say oh that password which account is that for oh that account <laughs> If you use a common password, that's the biggest no-no. If there's one thing you learn today from you go out of here, do not use the same password for two accounts. Uh, but anyway, right. So, that's the users. 
Now, we saw those users in WordPress, and there are the users in the my, the PHP. Okay. Um, so, what I want to do very quickly, I will prove that I can do WP scan URL local.apache slash WordPress. I'm going to tell it to only do usernames user and I'm going to tell it to use passwords test. Now I've already created a little test file there and the only thing in that test file is the password 123456. So if I run that ah, uh, and hopefully spell usernames correctly. The joys of being a dyslexic. Never mind. Uh, this should very quickly get that password. Very quickly. And it got it. There we go. So what can I do to stop that? apart from having a plugin, because we don't want a single point of failure. So if we want multiple levels of protection, what can we do to protect ourselves? And well, the answer is actually surprisingly simple. If I go in here and edit that user, and let's just change the login name to Omerta. I'll save that. Now, if I go back to here, use a, in fact, it's, I'm almost being caught out here, I will have to put in a Merta, one, two, three, four, five, six, because that's why it threw me out. You will see that within WordPress, it still says it's user, but I know different, I know it's called the Merta. Now, interestingly, most people that try and hack my website try for the account admin you will find I don't have an account called admin. WordPress thinks I have an account called admin, but I don't. <laughs> uh, if I go to here and try that again, I won't get in. It will say failed. But no valid passwords found. But if I come back to here and simply change user to Omerta, this time it will find it and I'll get in. So I think that's worthwhile doing. I wouldn't do it for every password on a website, on, on a WordPress website, but I would do it for the administrators. You don't really want to advertise your administrators and you probably don't want to have an account called admin. Change it to something else. <laughs> uh, and very oh. Come on. let me go back to yeah just so that I can ah oh, come on right because I have to get that picture in because to me that is the ultimate outside looking in that's actually taken from the moon looking back towards the earth uh, and I just thought that was an absolutely cracking picture which has an awful lot of interesting internet history to it. But yes, time is out. Questions? Very quickly, I will just mention that on the end of this presentation, I've stuck some additional commands and utilities that you might want to try if you do get Kali up and running, install Kali. Go and try those other ones as well. You will see some interesting output, not all of which you'll understand, but you will learn something from it. Um, we're going to do two quick questions because we do need to, to break for lunch. So, well, you see that um, WP scan? It's, in, it's not in Cali by default, so you just do up. It is in Cali by default. Is it? it yes. Is Cali by default. It has been for a long time. Okay. Uh, yes. The, the, the back is first. So yeah. Uh, can this tool help with finding 
Harry Wilson had been hard, and then Colin Hart came in because they had well. So fouls that might have uh, exploits in them or fouls that shouldn't be there. No, is the short answer. It might find some open doors that might give you some clues to how it may have been hacked. But it, no, it's not an auditing thing and it won't actually tell you what's there. You might see something that you go, oh, sugar, I've left, a, for example, an old config file. That's probably how they got in. But no, it's, 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 it's only going to give you some limited information. Uh, yeah, just uh, Bobby's through a lot of the users there. You mentioned about two-factor authentication, which I thought might have been something kind of security. You can do. Up until now, when I had been looking at two-factor, it typically was something you were having to pay for, and I was kind of avoiding it because of that. Yeah, the, the main thing I would say, whatever you go for, if you go down the route of two-factor, great, but test it. Try it out, see if there's ways around it, see what you can learn about it. Nigel, thank you so much. Um, I want to give my